So thank you, Andrew, for such a warm introduction. It's a great pleasure and an honour to give the 2023 Coxford Lecture here at the Law School uh, at Western University and in this beautiful um, court room. Many thanks to Professors Andrew Botterill and Wade Wright for inviting me to give this lecture and for patiently staying the course with me through the COVID pandemic and the lockdown to finally bring today's lecture to fruition. It's truly a delight to be here. Uh, but I want to register my special and sincere thanks to Stephen Coxford uh, for making today's event possible, and more broadly, for funding this prestigious lecture uh, series on the rule of law. Really, the former lecturers in, are the who's who of constitutional theory, and I'm truly honored uh, to follow in their footsteps. Now, as you know, the focus of the lecture series is on the rule of law. And in this lecture today, I want to explore this theme obliquely uh, by taking a comparative and critical look at the power of the legislature to override rights and override court rulings on rights in Canada and the United Kingdom. My title is The Underuse of the Override. And my argument will be that this underuse or at least rare use of the override is vital in promoting and protecting the rule of law on both sides of the Atlantic. So let's start by looking at the most famous legislative override provision in the English-speaking world, and that is the Canadian notwithstanding clause in Section 33 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, it seemed like a good idea for me to uh, give this lecture mostly on Section 33 when I was back in Dublin. <laughs> but standing before you, a very knowledgeable audience uh, on this topic, it seems like a less good idea now. But it's too late to change, and I'm going to go, go with it. So, as you know very well, Section 33 provides that the Parliament of Canada, or a provincial legislature, may expressly declare that an act or a legislative provision shall operate notwithstanding a number of specified charter rights. Now, although the power to legislate notwithstanding rights is set out in fairly broad terms, Section 33 nonetheless places significant limits on its use. And these are vital, I argue, to understanding the nature of the power. So let's go through the limits. First, there must be an express declaration to override a particular charter right. This means that the rights cannot be overridden covertly, uh, implicitly, or obliquely. <coughs> the second limitation is that the express declaration must be contained in an act of parliament. So why is that significant? It's significant because it means that any proposed override must go through the gauntlet of a full legislative process and is therefore subject to all the publicity, transparency, and accountability uh, mechanisms that are embedded in that process. It also ensures that in, over, in order for an override to become effective, to become law, it needs a majority support uh, in the legislature or parliament. So third, the override has a substantive limitation. It is only uh, uh, applicable to a certain set of rights, it's explicitly precluded for such fundamental matters as democratic rights, mobility rights, and language rights. Finally, it's subject to a sunset and reenactment clause, which means that if enacted, the override will cease to have effect after five years uh, after it comes into force, unless Parliament or the legislature explicitly reenacts it. Now, you can tell, and you perhaps already know, the rationale of this uh, subsection. The rationale is to make it more difficult to use the override. It means that any government or legislature which wishes to use it must not only summon one majority to get it over the legislative line, but uh, it requires a sustained, repeated mobilization of political support uh, to keep the override uh, on the statute books indefinitely. So while Section 33 gives Canadian legislatures the power to legislate notwithstanding rights, it is by no means a constitutional carte blanche. Instead, 
What it does is create a limited power of restricted substantive and temporal scope subject to what I would think of as a manner and form requirement about how it can be achieved. Now tellingly, section 33, the terms of the provision, do not speak in strident terms of legislatures overriding courts or legislatures disregarding uh, rights. Instead, it employs much more conditional and tentative wording, which acknowledges, yes, that legislatures may proceed with legislation notwithstanding, that is to say, despite some rights guaranteed in the Charter, subject to specified conditions and constraints. As the general heading to section 33 clarifies, the power to enact legislation notwithstanding rights, or notwithstanding court rulings on rights, is an exception to the general norm of charter compliance, the general obligation on all three branches of government, including the legislature, and including the governments, by the way, uh, to protect rights uh, unless there are uh, significant countervailing reasons <coughs> not to do so. So another way of putting this would be to say that despite the importance and cherished status of charter rights, legislatures are nevertheless entitled to legislate notwithstanding such rights if uh, certain conditions are met. Now this is why the comparative constitutional law scholar Stephen Gardban describes section 33 as a nevertheless clause, and why Dean Leckie of McGill Law School describes it as a derogation clause. Viewed as a whole, it seems to me that the Charter seeks to ensure that all branches of government generally comply with rights and commit to doing so, whilst providing a limited legislative derogation from certain rights under strictly confined conditions. Now the conditional terms and the qualified wording of section 33 bears all the marks of its origins. As you know, section 33 was part of an 11th hour compromise to get agreement between the federal government and the provincial leaders on the charter. Some provincial leaders feared that judicial decisions under the charter would unduly restrict their ability to protect deeply held social values institutions in their province. There was also a worry, and I would say a legitimate worry, about government by judiciary and the notorious counter-majoritarian difficulty. Therefore, these leaders wanted to ensure that in circumstances of deep disagreement amongst people and perhaps between the legislature and the courts, it was the democratically elected legislature which would ultimately uh, prevail. So though many of the key political architects who crafted the Charter were opposed uh, to the legislative override, including the then uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Section 33 was ultimately the deal-maker provision that made the Charter happen. Without Section 33, there probably would have been no Charter. Therefore, that underscores the importance of this provision to the compromise which was uh, struck at that time. Now from these humble beginnings in what some commentators have described as a grubby late night deal struck in the raw politics of constitutional compromise behind closed doors, the Canadian notwithstanding clause eventually basked in the glow of international admiration as an ingenious solution to the counter-majoritarian difficulty which had vexed American scholars for decades. Whilst inside Canada, champions of the Charter and doughty defenders of Charter rights uh, were learning to live with the override, as Professor Lorraine Weinberg put it, and yes, there were some who decided that they would stand up for the notwithstanding clause, like John uh, White did eventually, this clause uh, was fated as the new kid on the constitutional block. It was the most valuable piece of constitutional real estate on the comparative constitutional law scene. And little wonder, it seemed to cut the Gordian knot of reconciling judicially enforced rights and parliamentary uh, democracy.
uh, it seemed to give judges ample powers to uphold rights and even to strike down legislation which violated them. But this was offset, counterbalanced by uh, an unusual power, unusual at least in the English uh, language speaking world, uh, to have the last word, to override those court rulings if the democratically elected representatives uh, disagreed. So by combining judicial oversight with legislative override, we could protect rights whilst preserving democracy. We could have our constitutional cake and eat it too. Now, as a striking innovation in institutional design, it is unsurprising that it sparked the interest of comparative law scholars. What is also significant is that it unlocked the constitutional imagination of constitutional designers across the world. So if you turn your attention now across the Atlantic Ocean over to the United Kingdom in the uh, 90s, the Labour Party, who were out of power for 18 years, were trying to come up with a way of incorporating the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic UK law. And any proposals to develop a UK Bill of Rights had always foundered on the fact that it was thought to violate parliamentary sovereignty. Canada showed that the American model was not the only option on the table, and not the default option either. It showed that we could tinker with the variables, we could recalibrate the dynamics of constitutional rights-based review in a way that was compatible with traditions of parliamentary democracy and even compatible uh, with a system that was fundamentally based on the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. So, so how did the UK uh, reconcile these two principles that seemed to be in tension? It was inspired by the Canadian model, but it didn't follow it uh, uh, completely, mostly because it was thought that the judicial power to strike down the legislation uh, would violate parliamentary sovereignty, and I think more broadly was anathema to the political and constitutional culture in the UK. This was a step uh, uh, beyond which uh, UK constitutional law could not go. So let me just now provide you with a sketch of uh, the UK solution uh, to this conundrum, which was inspired by the Canadian model. Okay, so the Human Rights Act 1998, which encapsulated this compromise, this solution to the conundrum, uh, did two things in this space. The first was that it denied, it withheld from courts the power to strike down legislation, but it gave them instead two interesting powers. One was the power to interpret legislation compatibly with rights in a very robust and creative way, that's under Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, and it also gave the courts the power to issue what, was called, what is called a Declaration of Incompatibility. Now, the Declaration of Incompatibility had no binding force, it did not invalidate the legislation, but it handed over the issue to the legislature whereupon the legislature can consider that judicial declaration and then decide uh, whether and how to implement it. So under the Human Rights Act, the courts could declare, but they could not disapply. They could interrogate legislation, testing it for rights compliance, but they could not invalidate the legislation. So, so you can see the parallels with the override. There was a desire there to give courts powers of rights-based review, but not to take them so far that they would override the decisions of the democratic legislature. There was another provision, and this is the most direct analog uh, to the Canadian uh, notwithstanding clause, and this is contained in section 19 of the Human Rights Act, which empowers any government to propose and the legislature, the Westminster Parliament, then to enact a statute which seems to violate rights. So in subsection one, 
of Section 19, the relevant minister must make a statement about their view, so their, the, the minister and the government's view, about the potential compatibility of this proposed legislation uh, with rights. But whilst the expectation was that the government would normally make and normally ensure that all bills were compatible with rights, subsection 2 allowed the minister to propose legislation with the following words placed on the front of the bill, on the face of the bill, that the minister would make a statement to the effect that although he is unable to make a statement of compatibility, the government nevertheless wishes the House to proceed with the bill. Now notice the qualified, the conditional, the somewhat tortuous language of this provision. Uh, again, it echoes the Canadian notwithstanding clause. It does not say to the British government or uh, the Parliament at Westminster, you can override rights as you see fit and at any time without having to state it. No. It says you should make a statement about your view on compatibility. It, you know, the first assumption is you will make a statement that it is compatible, but we allow you, we give you a power and a restricted power at that to proceed with legislation and to propose it to Parliament, even if uh, it seems to you to violate rights. So by these two mechanisms, we have a different version of the nevertheless uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, again, the Human Rights Act affirms the importance of protecting rights in the UK constitutional order, but allows the democratic legislature to nevertheless <laughs> under some conditions to proceed with the bill. Now, there are some similarities and analogies, again, with how that could be done. And I'll just mention two. One was that this statement was subject to the publicity requirement, so the government would have to state publicly, I hear, we hereby propose this legislation, and we hereby publicly declare that we think it violates rights. It was also subject to the legislative process requirement. It wasn't just a public statement to the press or a public statement in Prime Minister's questions. It had to go through the full legislative process. The rationale here was not to allow for a, a gratuitous omnibus, free uh, wheeling override of rights. The rationale here was to allow the government and legislature to override rights if it thought uh, it was justified in doing so, but under certain conditions and whilst taking on board the burden of justification that the publicity requirement and the legislative process requirement entails. Okay, so the parallels now that I hope you can see between the Canadian model and the UK uh, solution were not lost on comparative constitutional lawyers. Quite quickly, leading comparative law scholars like Stephen Gardbaum and Rosalind Dixon and many others, and Mark Tushnet, of course, grouped these constitutional innovations together under the combined heading of being the new Commonwealth model of constitutionalism. There's a lot that could be said about the new model, but I just want to isolate one key and fundamental feature. And that fundamental feature was that although it gave courts powers to protect rights and to interpret legislation compatibly with them, it gave the legislature the last word. The legislative last word, as instantiated in the notwithstanding clause, as instantiated in the Declaration of Incompatibility, under the Human Rights Act was the key and pivotal feature which gave the, these constitutional documents, these statutory or constitutional bills of rights, their unique and distinctive function. Now, it was not long uh, before the override became the darling of dialogue and the doyen of a new form of democratic mm -hmm. constitutionalism. And you can see how this occurred. The metaphor fit quite nicely. You would have courts offering their view on what rights required. 
saying to the legislature, we think it's incompatible with rights, or in our view, it might be incompatible with rights, but it would go over to the legislature. And now the legislature uh, could talk back. So the dialogic framing was partly inspired by and partly fit with the notwithstanding clause, as did uh, arguments by a former uh, Coxford lecturer, Jeremy Waldron, um, that giving the legislature the last word was the holy grail of democratic constitutionalism. Now, despite expectations of a new constitutional dawn, the most well-known fact about these override provisions is that they have hardly ever been used. Now, I'm aware of the recent flurry of activity <laughs> at provincial level, but just bear with me for a moment. Um, let's start with Canada. So, the Canadian notwithstanding clause has never been used by the federal parliament of Canada. And it has only been used, actually used, in valid legislation uh, I would say by a handful of provincial legislatures, most prominently and frequently by Quebec, of course, uh, which invoked an omnibus override in the early days of the Charter. Uh, now, this led a, a, to a kind of consensus amongst Canadian constitutional law scholars, including Justice Huscroft in his former guise as Professor Brandt Huscroft uh, in those days, who said, this clause is not only unused, but unusable. I think that was the consensus position at that time, both among scholars within Canada and comparative constitutional law scholars looking from the outside. Okay, the political climate has changed now, and there is an uptick in the invocation of the override uh, across uh, many provincial legislatures, including Ontario. Uh, but many of these threatened uses have not come to fruition. They have uh, been thwarted either because they were deemed unnecessary, you know, the court decision was changed or for other reasons, or because of public and political outcry. So even factoring in the recent resurgence uh, at provincial level, I would say the overall picture over four decades is one of underuse or relatively uh, rare use. There have only been 22 successful uses of the override uh, in 40 years, with Quebec still accounting for 17 of those uses. So I, I would still say that there is a marked political reluctance and reticence uh, to use the override in the Canadian political culture. Looking at the UK, a similar picture of rare use, you could say underuse, uh, uh, applies. In the two decades since the Human Rights Act was enacted, the UK government has only made one, uh, well, two negative uh, statements of incompatibility at the beginning of the legislative process. One was in relation to um, the Communications Act 2003, which dealt with paid political advertising. And in that case, uh, the uh, override, if you would like to put it that way, was actually upheld subsequently, both by the domestic courts and the Strasbourg courts, as compatible with rights. The second use is currently before Parliament, a very controversial illegal migration uh, bill, and, and that has a different political complexion altogether, which I, I cannot go into uh, here. Suffice it to say that being a once in a decade occurrence is not exactly an ongoing dialogue and disagreement between the courts and legislatures on the meaning of rights. If you turn to the Declaration of Incompatibility, then, so this is the power of the courts to declare as incompatible, but it has no uh, uh, invalidating effect. You might think that the legislature would do as dialogue scholars and many others expected them to do, to think about it, to mull over the options, and then think, well, actually, we disagree in this situation, we'll just ignore it, or we'll enact legislation to override it. This has not occurred of the 33 declarations of incompatibility, the final declarations since the Human Rights Act was enacted, uh, they have been implemented 
in almost every single case. There is a near perfect, and some would say a perfect, rate of compliance with declarations of incompatibility since the Human Rights Act was enacted. So this presents a puzzle for constitutional theorists and comparative constitutional law scholars alike. If the perennial problem of US-style constitutional review is that the legislature is unjustifiably thwarted by the courts and shackled by the uh, enemies of the people, by these elitist decisions, then surely we would expect that in countries where the legislature are explicitly, expressly given the power to either ignore uh, uh, just or override those decisions, they would seize the opportunity to do so. If, if the legislative override is the democratic savior of rights-based review, then what explains the curious and conspicuous underuse of the override uh, in both countries? It seems as if the legislature is not as keen to be saved uh, as was assumed by many scholars which were who were writing as these innovative constitutional systems were devised. Okay, so needless to say, there are lots of possible answers uh, to solve this mystery. Why is the override underused? So, synopsizing quite quickly, I'll just give you a flavor. In the Canadian scholarship, uh, there are a few common arguments that form a kind of dominant narrative. One was a kind of path dependence argument. So, uh, there was, a, if you like, a controversial or perhaps even discredited use of the override in Quebec at the days of the Charter, and that set the politics on a path-dependent route that made it seem illegitimate, or at least not a legitimate modus operandi uh, for responsible politicians in the Canadian constitutional culture. The other is the textual constraints arguments. So cast your mind back to those limitations I outlined in section 33. They are quite formidable. Some people said, well, the underuse of the override was due to these you know, inhibiting factors in section 33. Another was a fear about political reputation. In other words, that if, um, if a government or a legislature comes out and says, we want this legislation, but we can tell you that it violates rights. That is both bad politics um, uh, and bad in reputational terms. So this led to uh, an underuse of the override. The, the other reason is that the notwithstanding clause is portrayed in Canadian constitutional writing in dramatic and drastic terms. So I found metaphors like it's a nuclear bomb, it's a sledgehammer, it's the sword of Damocles, it's a loaded gun, and even a dagger pointed at the heart of our fundamental freedom. <laughs> so, so needless to say, if the override is perceived in those dramatic terms as a nuclear bomb, it doesn't require much constitutional sophistication to work out that elected politicians are going to hold back a bit before reaching uh, for the nuclear button. And indeed, there are plenty of options uh, that they have. They can try and justify limitation on rights during the litigation process, or they can enact legislation that implements a ruling in minimal terms uh, while still preserving the guts of their own policy uh, preference. But whatever the disparate nature of all of these arguments, both in Canada and the UK, they both converge on, on a common theme. And that is that the legislatures in both countries wanted to use the override, but they were thwarted from doing so. They were prevented from doing so uh, by uh, the political costs. Now what I want to argue here before you today is that whilst the political costs are undoubtedly part of the story, they cannot be the whole story. And they are not, I suggest, the most important part uh, either. The reason for that is uh, manifold. One is that the, it is not clear, at least in the UK context, that the political costs all pull in favour of rights compliance. There is plenty of 
argument that in fact adopting a rights violating stance, using it as a weapon on woke, uh, and invoking it against deeply discriminated and uh, marginalized minorities, would actually win electoral credit at the polls, not damage the electoral chances uh, of any government who wish to pursue it. But there's a deeper problem, I suggest, with the dominant narrative of thwarted potential and the unrealized promise of democratic dialogue. And that is that it seems to rest on the assumption that these override provisions were designed, were intended uh, to be used in the form of an ongoing conversation between the legislature and the courts on the meaning of rights. You know, the courts say, I believe X, and then the legislature say, I disagree. And in this interlocutory process, uh, you know, the legislature decides what it wants to do. But when we look at the legislative process, not only in Canada, but also on, in the UK, what is striking is that virtually none of the key political architects who devised these innovations on either side of the Atlantic used this dialogic or disagreement <coughs> type framing when justifying the override. In Canada, yes, there was obviously a difference of opinion between those who opposed it and those who agreed it on it, but ultimately they agreed on uh, uh, an understanding of the override, which perceived it as a safety valve to be used in rare and exceptional uh, circumstances. The conditions placed on it were precisely designed uh, to deter, to deflect, or at least to disincentivize. Uh, legislatures across Canada or the federal parliament from using this clause uh, in a loose and liberal way. Similarly in the UK, when you go through the parliamentary debates as the Human Rights Act was being enacted, what you find is recurrent, not isolated statements, but recurrent affirmations uh, of statements by ministers and also the Lord Chancellor, uh, Lord Irvine, um, that ministers, he said, will obviously want to make a positive statement of compatibility and that it was incumbent upon ministers to make sure that their legislation complied with rights. So the rationale of section 19 and indeed section 4 was not to unleash a new dawn of uh, rights violations as a daily occurrence. It was to allow the legislature to have, yes, the last word under strictly confined circumstances, but it was the last word as last resort. This was not an open dialogue on a daily basis. This was a safety valve in a boiler. You don't need to use the safety valve on a, on a daily basis. It could go 20 years without that safety valve uh, going off. Nonetheless, we may want to have one. And I think that the notwithstanding clause, the override, is a perfectly justified provision to have in a Bill of Rights document, but not uh, in the form of an interinstitutional disagreement uh, in the way that many scholars uh, assumed. So this gives us, the legislative history gives us a vital clue uh, which helps us understand the mystery of the underuse of the override. Namely, that the political costs were fully known by the political actors who crafted these innovations and these compromises, and they were hardwired into the document with foresight, not with oversight. This was over underuse by uh, design, not demonization. The political costs that would deter and disincentivize frequent or liberal use of the override were built into the process uh, from the get-go. Uh, they were a feature, not a bug in the system. Now, you could say, well, this may be a contingent feature of the politics in the UK and Canada. You could say it's just a constitutional coincidence that on both sides of the Atlantic, the political architects made it, A, more difficult to use 
the, uh, the override than simply being able to do it without any constraints. And second of all, that they expected it not to be used very often. They expected rare uh, use of the override, not frequent daily occurrence. But I don't buy this account of uh, political contingency. It seems unsatisfactory to me. I think there's a deeper story to be told here about why political actors on both sides of the Atlantic engage in a practice of underusing their override and in designing those overrides in a way that would generate such a practice. And the deeper story, I believe, is rooted in the idea of the collaborative uh, constitution, uh, the topic of my forthcoming book, and the unwritten norms which make a constitution work. So I just want to, in the final section of the lecture now, sketch out the main uh, uh, features of this deeper story, which provides a normative undergirding for the practice as we've seen it uh, uh, in Canada and the UK. Okay, so I talked about the unwritten norms that make a well-functioning constitution work. What are they? There are many, but I'll just concentrate on two. The first is that there is an obligation in well-functioning systems, there is a well, an obligation on all three branches, not just the courts, so the legislature and, by the way, the executive too, uh, to uphold fundamental constitutional principles, including the rule of law, and including rights if they are guaranteed in a statutory or constitutional bill of rights, as they are in Canada uh, and the UK. So all three branches of government have a shared responsibility, a joint and individual obligation to commit to rights uh, and the rule of law. So in this context, a legislative override is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, and it cannot be. It cannot be invoked whenever the government decides they want to play their hand. It is a limited power of derogation from fundamental norms when, and only when, the derogations are under, meet a significant burden of justification. Okay, so that's the, the norm of, if you like, committing to constitutional principles, which applies to all three branches of government. The second norm is the norm of comity, or mutual respect between the branches of government, where each branch plays a distinct uh, but complementary role in the constitutional scheme, whilst working together with their partners in authority, uh, working towards the common goal of honoring constitutional values. Now, to be clear, the duty of county doesn't preclude disagreement between the branches. It doesn't, of course, uh, stand against checks and balances. Checks and balances are part and parcel uh, of a robust and well-functioning uh, system. We absolutely need them there. But the principle of county does preclude a government of the day uh, easily, lightly, or glibly tossing aside a judicial decision on rights or any other matter, by the way, simply because it disagrees with the outcome. Have a think about what would happen if there was a flourishing practice of legislative override of judicial decisions uh, as envisaged and advocated by many of these scholars working within the uh, dialogue or disagreement uh, framing. Well, one is that it would, I think, compromise judicial independence. For judges to be truly independent, they have to work in an environment where they know that if they hand down a decision that is unwelcome or inconvenient to the powers that be, that those powers will then nonetheless uphold that decision and implement it uh, in good faith. So allowing for a regular or routine override, I think, would compromise judicial independence and with it the rule of law which underpins it. Um, the, the second problem is that if the legislature regularly second-guessed court decisions, substituting theirs for those of the judiciary, this would strain the relations of comity and collaboration between the branches, 
and subvert the constitutional division of labor uh, on which the constitution rests. So if you have an antagonistic move by one branch that can spark retaliation, and you get a conflictual dynamic that often is not uh, a healthy feature of a constitutional system grounded in the rule of law. The third reason is that a regular o override of judicial decisions would create enormous uncertainty, unpredictability, and unfairness for litigants. If judicial decisions are merely provisional pronouncements subject to regular reversal by the legislature, this would mean that the litigants would not maybe go to court in the first place, or if they did, they would know that they could not rely on the courts to give them an authoritative ruling uh, about what their rights require. So these reasons ground a normative argument that the legislative override is correctly understood, in my view, as a safety valve for exceptional circumstances to be treated with caution and care, rather than a regular outlet for inter-institutional dialogue and disagreement about rights. Now this does not preclude or deny the possibility or indeed the legitimacy of using the override under certain circumstances. I think Professor Dwight Newman from the University of Saskatchewan has made a very good case for good justifications for using the override in some circumstances. I don't deny that. My argument, however, is narrower. It is that this clause it carries with it some attendant dangers, both for the rule of law, for judicial independence, and for rights uh, protection. And therefore, it should be, like any powerful tool, it should be uh, handled with care. So once we situate the override, and I'm coming to uh, uh, the end of the argument now, once we situate the override in the context of the constructive working relationships which ought to exist between the branches of government, we can see that the legislature does not and should not have the kind of equal revisory or dialogic role attributed to them by dialogue scholars. The relationship between the branches of government is just not like a conversation uh, between each in my way of looking at constitutional government, their relationship is better characterized as a working relationship between differently situated branches where each has a distinct but valuable role to play, but each must also respect the authoritative work product of the other. So foregrounding these norms of comity and collaboration and conflict avoidance, I conclude that legislatures should apply, and in Canada and the UK, for the most part, do apply a general presumption in favor of compliance with judicial decisions and compliance with rights, unless that presumption is rebutted by exceptional and egregious circumstances. So the argument is to limit the use to rare use, and it has a disjunctive structure, only if these conditions are met. And only if, by the way, the argument is stronger than the legislature or the government simply saying, we disagree uh, with the outcome of the judicial decision. Okay, I just want to make uh, two brief final points and then uh, I'll conclude. Am I over? I'm okay to, to make that. Yeah. So the argument I've advanced has a number of different consequences which I can only gesture at here, but I'll just mention two. Uh, one is that it provides um, a different reading of the practice. So rather than the underuse of the override being somehow a tragic undermining of democratic constitutionalism or a reneging on the great value of democratic dialogue, under my argument, the rare use or the underuse of the override in both countries, it may actually be to the credit uh, of the governments and legislatures in, uh, in both countries, it may be to their credit, not to their 
Chardin. Rather than being a tragedy to bug old, I suggest that the cautious and careful treatment uh, of the override is in fact an achievement, an achievement of constitutional democracy, uh, which we should treasure. Uh, and I think the recent invitations of the override in the provinces and in the UK Parliament, currently under the Illegal Migration Bill, bear out this argument. These are not always edifying instances of some high-minded form of democratic constitutionalism. They are more like um, uh, uh, governments acting, sometimes in bad uh, faith, sometimes with animus. Uh, uh, against uh, rights, and it is not a constitutional success story. So on the collaborative way of looking at this practice evolved over time, it's, it's, there's no tragedy here in the underuse. We, there is even perhaps cause to celebrate. And the final consequence, which I want to mention, uh, goes to statements made by former Coxford lectures, uh, lecturers, Jeffrey Goldsworthy and Jeremy Waldron. Both of these eminent scholars have argued, they, they've looked at the practice, they've seen the underuse of the override, and they have made famous arguments that the text of section 33 should be changed and tweaked in order to license a vigorous and flourishing practice of legislative override uh, of judicial decisions. In their view, Elected politicians are typically advocates, not antagonists uh, of rights. And if we could just change the precise terms of Section 33, we can make it clear that when a government invokes the override, they are doing so for rights-protecting uh, reasons, or at least that they are only disagreeing with the courts. They are not taking issue with rights in general. So there's a lot to be said about that argument, and I'll just make two brief points. One is that whether elected politicians are advocates or antagonists of rights is an empirical question, which must be tested uh, in individual contexts and uh, will vary perhaps across issue and over time. Uh, looking at even the Canadian and the UK context, I think there is reason to doubt uh, that elected politicians on some occasions uh, have, have only noble rights disagreements, not illegitimate uh, uh, rights misgivings. Um, but, the, but the deeper point and the deeper problem I have with this argument is the assumption that by tweaking the constitutional design in this minor way, uh, we could change the political practice so that it becomes one of a thriving democratic constitutionalism. As I see it, this uh, overlooks these underlying deep constitutional norms which frame and shape political uh, behavior and ought to do so. I would also say uh, in uh, scholarly engagement with former Coxford lectures that it is interesting and I think telling that that these arguments were written pre-Trump, pre-Brexit, pre what's going on in Israel uh, at the moment, and therefore uh, they, they have a gloss of democratic constitutionalism that I think would meet with stronger and more robust counter-arguments uh, in the current political moment. So to conclude, the Canadian Charter and the UK Human Rights Act absolutely gave their respective legislatures the power, the option, of overriding judicial decisions on rights and even overriding rights. But the unwritten uh, norms and practices of what I describe as the collaborative constitution, the norms of mutual respect, of committing to the common cause of protecting constitutional values, gives them a responsibility to exercise that option with caution and care and with due regard uh, for the role of the other branches. The power of override, I argue, uh, was and must be coupled with the duty to act uh, with care and cognitive. 
that was what was intended by the original drafters of these mechanisms. That is what has happened in practice. Through my eyes, uh, that is an achievement of constitutional democracy, not one uh, we should uh, lament and decry. Thank you very much.